All right. So last time in chapter four, you learned about calculating standard deviation and the spread that comes around a set of data. So this time we want to talk about a little bit more about accuracy and precision and talk about where error can come into your data and how you can reflect that in your calculations. So errors that are associated with a central tendency reflect the accuracy of the analysis, but the precision of the analysis is going to be determined by those errors that are associated with the spread. So let's see exactly what that means. So accuracy is going to be a measure of how close a measure of central tendency is to the true or the expected value, which we call mu. Right, so accuracy is usually expressed as either an absolute error or a percent relative error. Right, so if we are looking at the absolute error, we would have our measurement, right, the mean of our data, and then this would be subtracted from the true value, mu. If we take the percent relative error, um, you can see the E relative, right, is going to be my mean minus the mu or the true value over mu times 100%. So you've calculated percent error in a lot of your experiments up to date. Um, so a lot in, in chemistry 200, you would calculate percent error and see how are my measurements actually measuring to what I expect to get. So this is just review so far. So if we're thinking about errors in a little bit more detail, you can have what's called a determinant error. And so these are errors that affect the accuracy of the analysis. And they're characterized by a systematic deviation from the true value. So sometimes you may have positive determinant errors and these result in a central value that's gonna be larger than the true value. And sometimes you have negative determinant errors which lead to a central value that's gonna be smaller than the true value. So for our determinant errors, these can be divided into four classes that include sampling errors, method errors, measurement errors, and personal errors. So when we think about sampling errors, we introduce these types of errors when our sampling strategy fails to provide a representative sample. So in this picture here, you can see this algal bloom here. So if I was trying to measure the effect of the algal bloom or the growth of the algal bloom within the lake, and I take all of my samples over in here, I'm going to create a sampling error because this is obviously a heterogeneous sample, and it's not going to be equivalent if I'm going to take a sample from here versus over here. So that would be an example of a sampling error. So determinant method errors can be introduced when your assumption about the relationship between the signal and the analyte are not valid, right? So um, here's your equations again for the total analysis method and the concentration method. And remember that the reagent blank is going to give some of the signal in the sample. And if this is determined incorrectly, then it's going to affect your calculation of your total amount or your concentration of your unknown. So this could be an issue with sensitivity of the instrument that you're using to measure these, or if you have any interference within the sample that are getting in the way of your signal data. So you can also have measurement errors that happen, um, analytical instruments and equipment, such as the glassware and the balances, have a statement on them with their maximum measurement error and the tolerance. So if you look at a 25 milliliter volumetric flask, for example, it might have a maximum error of plus or minus 0 0.03 mils, meaning that your actual volume that contain, that's contained within the flask when you've got it up to that meniscus line actually lies within a range of 24.97 to 25.03 mils. So even though this is a range, the error is actually determinant. So the flask's true volume is a fixed value within that stated range somewhere in there. So you can see for any glassware that you would be using inside the lab, um, it's going to have an error range, right? And so that's going to be 
given. Usually it's written on the piece of glassware that you're using to do a measurement, whether it's a volumetric flask, a burette, or a transfer pipette. And you can see that there is different type of glassware. There's uh, class A glassware and there's also class B glassware. And you can see class B glassware is not as accurate as the class A glassware, right? You've got less measurement error that you're going to create if you're using class A glassware when you're making measurements. So this uh, also depends on how rich your lab is because the class B glassware is a lot cheaper than the class A glassware. So, and you can also get the measurement error for any instrument that you're actually using. So things like the balances or digital pipettes, they also have an error range. And then that fourth class was personal errors. Analytical work is always going to be subject to a variety of personal errors that are created by the researcher themselves. So you may not have the ability to see a change in the color of an indicator that's used to signal the endpoint of a titration, for example. And so you don't stop in time. Or you may have biases. You may consistently overestimate or underestimate the value based on an instrument's readout, right? And so that's going to give you some bias in your data. You may be failing to calibrate your glassware or your instrumentation before you use it. Or you may misinterpret procedural directions while you're doing an experiment. So these happen over time. Um, you'll find that at some time or another, if you're in the lab long enough, that you're going to have these types of personal errors. So you always want to try to minimize these and to recognize when they happen when you're collecting your data so that you can correct for them. So how do you go about identifying determinant errors? This can be very difficult. You're making your measurements, you think the data is good, you take that data, and then you do your calculation. So some errors can be noticed when you're collecting your data if the right actions are taken. So let's take a look at when you have a constant determinant error. These happen when the magnitude of a constant determinant error is the same for all the samples. So it becomes more significant when you're analyzing small samples. So let's look at an example. So if we have a constant positive determinant error, where we're always getting a sample that's going to be larger than the true value, say we have a constant error of 0 0.010 grams for all of the samples that we're measuring, right? So if we have a very large sample, right, and our true mass of our analyte is 0.5 grams, that 0 0.01 extra grams, right, is going to show up as 0 0.510. So that's going to be less easy to see because that's a large sample. But if we have a set of samples that we're measuring, we can see that the values that are, are being calculated now for our true value or the percent of the analyte that's reported, it should be the same, right, for all of these samples. But if you analyze a smaller sample and then calculate your true mass back here, and then calculate that percent analyte reported, you can see you overestimate it a lot higher if you have smaller samples that you're measuring, right? Because this is now contributing significantly to the mass of your analyte that's determined. So you can see that error in your sampling um, if you do a range of samples and you can say there is some constant error that's in there that I need to account for when I'm analyzing my analyte. So you can also have a proportional determinant error. And this is when the error's magnitude depends on the amount of sample. This is more difficult to detect because the result of the analysis is really independent of the amount of the sample. So you don't see it like you do with the uh, constant error. So remember when we were looking back at this constant error, when we were uh, measuring very small samples, we had a very big error that was happening and we overestimated the percent of the analyte that was reported in that sample. However, if you have a proportional error, 
you get the same value for all of your samples, even though the true mass of the sample is 0 0.100, we are measuring it as 0 0.101. And in all of our other samples, it's going to be 1% error on all of these samples. And so when we get the percent analyte that's reported weight by weight, right, we're going to get the same value for these. So um, we might be likely to say, oh, my data looks really good. I'm getting the same result when I have different amounts of my sample that I'm analyzing. So this is a lot harder to detect. And our sensitivity may be affected when you have proportional errors like this. So that's the errors around accuracy. How about precision? Precision is a measure of the spread of the data around a central value. And we typically express that as the range, the standard deviation, or the variance. So we already talked about those values, and you know how to calculate each of those. So precision is commonly divided into these two categories, either repeatability or reproducibility. So repeatability is the precision obtained when all of the measurements are made by the same analyst during a single period of lab work using the same solutions and equipment, right? So you may be setting up three of whatever you're doing, right? And measuring it three times. You've used the same solutions. You're working with the same pipettes. All of that is the same. And so that's your ability to be able to repeat your experiment during a single period of lab work. Reproducibility, however, is the precision obtained under any other set of conditions. And this can include between analysts in different laboratories, for example, or between laboratory sessions for a single analyst. So say you do this experiment in January and you get some data and then your boss or whatever wants you to do it again and see if you get the same data. They're like, this is really interesting. Can you reproduce this? And then you go and do that experiment again and see if you can obtain that same data. So this is where we get into indeterminate errors. These are errors that affect the distribution of measurements around a central value. These are the indeterminate errors. And these are typically characterized by random variation in both magnitude and direction. So where are sources of indeterminate errors? They're in the collection of the samples, the manipulation of the samples during the analysis, and maybe mishandling during the measurement process. So spilling things, collecting them haphazardly, not being careful, and you're having trouble with this precision in your data collection. So now that we've seen some of the differences between determinate and indeterminate errors, let's link this with uncertainty. So errors, right, are the difference between a single measurement or result and its true value. And so we talked about measuring that um, as just subtracting the mean from uh, the mu, the true value, or getting a percent error. So uncertainty is going to express the range of possible values that a measurement or a result might reasonably be expected to have. So this is going to differ from the precision as it's going to account for all of the errors, both the determinant and the indeterminate errors that might affect the result of an experiment. So not only the indeterminate errors. So how do we calculate uncertainty? You can use your precision to help you calculate uncertainty, right? So if you have a pipette and you use it 10 times, right? So that you are trying to determine the uncertainty or the spread of the sampling that you get from that pipette, right? You want, you want to determine the error around your measurements, right? So you, you, you do 10 measurements. Maybe you're just measuring water and you're going to weigh the water at the end and then convert it back to the milliliters that you measure based on the density of water. This would be a way of determining um, how much volume that you actually have every time you're doing the pipette. So if this is a 10 mil class A pipette and you're doing these 
measurements over and over again, you're going to see you're not going to get exactly 10.000 in any one measurement. Right? So if our class A pipette is rated at 10 plus or minus 0 0.02, the plus or minus 0 0.02 is the uncertainty of that measurement instrument. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the uncertainty that you're getting during your measurements is that high, right? You can do measurements in the lab experimentally to find the actual mean that you're getting and then calculate that standard deviation. So if you do these 10 measurements and then you calculate the mean and you calculate the standard deviation, you'll find that the mean for this data set is 9.992 and the standard deviation is plus or minus 0 0.006. So when you do a calibration like this, you can lower your uncertainty, right? So now you've more accurately stated the deliverance volume of this pipette. You now know it's 9.992 plus or minus 0 0.006 mils rather than the 10.00 plus or minus 0 0.02 that the manufacturer told you. So if you need greater accuracy in your measurements, it's, it's worth taking the time to actually calibrate your own instrumentation. So for a pipette like this, that's pretty easy to do if you have a balance around. So what about if we're making measurements and we have to use a pipette twice or even multiple times? How do we end up calculating the air for that pipette if we had to use it twice to add samples to our flask? So say I needed to measure out 20 milliliters into a volumetric and do a dilution with that, right? I would have my 10 mil pipette and then I would have to calculate that air as it's propagated over that use. So we can think about this in two ways, right? So say we have our average milliliters, right? We could say it's going to be plus or minus both of those standard deviations that are around there. So we could say maybe it's both plus, right? We add both of those on there and now it's plus or minus 0 0.012. Or what if we said it was above in the first one and then below th with that standard deviation in the second one? then we would say that error is plus or minus 0 0.000 mils. So you can see that this is not a very accurate way to think about the propagation of error because I would say I'm perfect in the second one and we know we're never perfect. So, but in that first scenario, we're likely actually overestimating the error as well because we added both of those just together and then put them on the end. So in this first scenario, it looks like we're overestimating the error. And in the second scenario, we are definitely underestimating the error. So what can we do to fix this? We're going to use a system that's called propagation of errors. So the symbols that we use for propagation of uncertainty, R is the result, A, B, and C are the measurements, and then the corresponding uncertainties are going to be S, for R, S for A, S for B, and S for C. So if we're adding or subtracting, our absolute uncertainty in the result is going to be the square root of the sum of the squares of the absolute uncertainties for the individual measurements. So remember when we were doing standard deviation and we had to do the squares so that we could make them all positive so that we weren't getting subtracting out um, around that mean. That's the same thing that we're going to do here as well. So we're going to take the square of the absolute uncertainties for our individual measurements for A, B, and C, which gives us the result, right? And then I'm going to add those together and then take the square root of that. And that will be the uncertainty for the result. And this will take care of all of those different situations, um, whether I have A plus B plus C or A plus B minus C or any other combination of adding or subtracting A, B, and C. The absolute uncertainty in R 
is shown from that equation up here. So this is our equation for adding and subtracting. So if we have our 10 mil pipette and we have that data set that we uh, just talked about, and we want to deliver two successive volumes, calculate the absolute and relative uncertainties for those total delivered volumes. So go ahead and pause this here and try to do those calculations. And we already calculated the mean and the standard deviation to help you out. All right. So if you're ready now, let's take a look at the answer. So we know the total delivered volume is obtained by adding the volumes of each delivery. So we can calculate the volume total. It's going to be 9.992 mils plus the 9.992 mils or 19.984 mils. So we can use our standard deviation as an estimate then of the uncertainty in the total delivered volume. And we're going to use our equation that we just talked about. So S for the total result is going to equal the square root of the standard deviation squared for each measurement. Right, so this is measurement A, this is measurement B, this is our standard deviation for measurement A and the standard deviation for measurement B. They're the same because I'm using the same pipette that has that same error. So I take the square, I add those together, and then I take the square root and I get 0 0.0085. So we can report the volume and its absolute uncertainty is 19.984 plus or minus 0 0.008 mils. Okay, so we've done some rounding here, right? Because I only go out three places here. I can only go out three places here. And so we're using the technique of rounding to the evens uh, when we're doing this. And this helps us avoid bias, right? Because five is right in the middle. So if we always round up with five, we're going to be incorrect in our data sets. Um, and create bias in those data sets. So we do what's, what's called rounding to the even. When you have five that you're absolute, you know, there's nothing past it, um, and you need to round back to a number. If that number is even, you're going to round down and go back to the even number. If this was an odd number, say it was five, for example, and your answer is 0 0.0055, then you would round up to the even, right? And so you would round up to six in that case. So this is rounding to the evens. If you have an even number down there, you're going to round down to it. If you have an odd number there, you're going to round up to the even number. So that's why you round down in this case over here. We can also calculate the relative uncertainty for the total delivered volume. And this is like our percent error, right? So we've got 0 0.0085 over the 19.984 times 100. And so our percent relative error is going to be 0.043%. So you can see that's very low. All right, so what about relative uncertainties if we're multiplying or dividing? We have a different equation that we're going to need to use to calculate these. So in this case, you're still doing a square root and you're still doing square values, but you're going to take that standard deviation for each of the measurements and divide them by the measurements themselves before you take the square for each of the measurements that you need to um, propagate in your uncertainty. Right, so if you have three measurements, then you would have those three values. You would take the square of that proportion, add them together, and then take the square root. And that's going to equal the standard deviation over the real value. So this is going to occur if you are, again, multiplying your values or doing any combination of multiplication and division. So let's look at a problem where we're using multiplication. So in this case, the quantity of charge Q in coulombs passing through an electrical circuit is calculated using the equation Q equals I times T, where I is the current in amperes 
and t is the time in second so in seconds so when a current of 0 0.15 plus or minus 0 0.01 amps passes through the circuit for 120 plus or minus one second the total charge is 18 coulombs okay and you get that by just putting your numbers in here you can see the number for i and the number for t so what are you going to do with these uncertainties that are in here how do you calculate the absolute and relative uncertainties for that total charge well we go ahead and use this equation so we have two measurements that we've done we've done the measurement for the current and we've done the measurement for the time. So here is our equation. You've got the air or uncertainty around the current divided by the measurement of the current squared plus that ratio of the time plus or minus one second. And then that is going to be squared. Add those together. Take the square root. And the number that you get out is equal to the uncertainty of the measurement over that measurement. So then you're going to take this value and you're going to multiply it by R, right, to get the SR or the absolute uncertainty, right? And so we know R from our calculation on this previous page is going to be 18 coulombs, right? We just calculated that there. So we just can go ahead and put that 18 in there times this value that we just calculated. And that's going to give us plus or minus 1.2. And so this again is the absolute uncertainty. So if we were going to then show our equation with the absolute uncertainty, we would say 18 plus or minus 1.2. And so we need to do some rounding here. We only go to the ones position in this case. So we need to round back to the ones position in our final answer. And so we'll report the charge as 18 coulombs plus or minus 1 coulomb. And similarly to what we did last time, you could also calculate the percent uncertainty as well. So what happens if you have mixed operations? Maybe you do some addition or subtraction in some of your measurements, and then in others you do multiplication or division. So how do you treat these operations and calculate the propagation of uncertainty doing that? So, well, let's take a look at an example and see how we treat this. So for a concentration technique, we know our relative relationship is the signal measured equals K times, times the concentration of the analyte plus the signal from the reagent. So our question is asking us to calculate the absolute and relative uncertainties for the analyte's concentration if S measured is 24.37 plus or minus 0 0.02. S reagent is 0 0.096 plus or minus 0 0.02. And K is 0 0.186 plus or minus 0 0.003 parts per million. Right? Well, if we look at our equation, we've got multiplication right here. And then between these two values, we have addition. So how do we go about handle, handling the propagation of air? Well, we need to rearrange the equation first and solve for CA so we can put all our values in without the errors around there. Right? And we put our values in, we measure the concentration of A. That turns out to be 125.9 parts per million. Right? And we just get those values again from the given data that's in there, right? 24.37, and 0.186. We're ignoring the air range around them. And then we look back at how we did our equation up here, right? We've got subtraction going on between these two measurements, and then we have division going on, right? So we're gonna pay attention to the numerator first where we have subtraction. So we have our analyte's concentration. If we round up, it's 126 parts per million. And we want to estimate the uncertainty in CA. So we have to first determine the uncertainty for the numerator, which is S measured minus S reagent. And we're going to do that with our addition subtraction equation. 
right? So we're just going to take the errors around those two values, the signal measured and the signal of the reagent for our problem set, right? These are both going to be 0.02. Okay, so we just put that into our equation. We'll take the square, add them together, then take the square root, and that will give me the absolute error for the numerator. And that comes out to 0 0.028, right? And we can look at the numerator. The numerator in our equation is 24.37 minus 0.96 or 23.41. And then we would say plus or minus 0 0.028. Right now we're retaining an extra significant figure and we will use this uncertainty then in our further calculations and we'll only round at the very end. And now we have to use our division equation, right? To calculate the propagation of uncertainty in the next calculation. So we've calculated what the numerator is with its uncertainty, and then we know k as well, right? So k was given, so we know k is 0.186 plus or minus 0 0.003 parts per million. We're going to use that in our lower part of the equation. So for division, we know our equation that we have to use is a little more complicated, right? But we're going to take that value of the numerator right, of our standard error around that or uncertainty around that divided by the value that we calculated, right, which is this. We're going to take the square of that and then we have our value for k that we measured plus the error or uncertainty around that. We're going to square that, add those together, take the square root, and that's going to give us 0 0.0162 which represents the uncertainty over R. And so then um, we need to further calculate that back out to isolate the uncertainty of the equation. So we're going to calculate 125.9 parts per million times 0 0.0162. That gives us plus or minus 2 parts per million. So we can measure the analyte's concentration then totally as 126 plus or minus 2 parts per million. Whew, that was a lot, right? So for each operation, you have to split it up and you have to do them separately and then uh, go to the next operation to calculate your uncertainty if you have a mixture of what you're doing. All right. So there's a lot of different mathematical functions that you can do and that are commonly used in analytical chemistry. These include things like powers and roots and logarithms, not just addition, subtraction, and multiplication and division. All right, so they each have their way of being able to calculate the uncertainty for those selected functions. So this table that's provided in your textbook online, this is a really good one to print and to kind of keep in your lab notebook. It will help you um, be able to calculate the uncertainty or the propagation of uncertainty when you're doing multiple operations inside an equation. All right, so let's try one more problem. So we know the pH of a solution is defined as pH equals the negative log of the concentration of the protons. And so this is the molar concentration. So if we have a pH of a solution that is 3.72, and we know the absolute uncertainty is plus or minus 0 0.03, what is the molar concentration of the protons and what is its absolute uncertainty? Okay, so what do we first have to do here? We have to rearrange this and we have to solve for the molar concentration of the protons because that's what we want to end up calculating. How do we do that when we have a logarithm? All right, if you remember from general chemistry, we are going to use the log base 10 so we can uh, take the log away if we raise everything to the power of 10, right? So this, the log will go away and then we have to raise this to the 10 to the minus pH. 
And that's going to give us the molar concentration of our protons, right? And so we can substitute in the pH and we can calculate the molar concentration of the protons in that solution. So that's pretty straightforward. Hopefully that seems like review from uh, 200 level chemistry, right? And uh, we will round to two significant figures for this data at the end, right? We have 1.9 times 10 to the minus four moles per liter. So how do we calculate the uncertainty for this measurement, right? Well, we need to go back to our table and see what we need to use for that calculation. Well, here, when our um, amount, our R value, is calculated by 10 to the superscript, this is the equation that we want to end up using. SR over R equals 2.303 uh, times the standard deviation of our measurement. Right, so if we come back and we look at that, right, this is the equation that we want to use. And then we can just start putting in our values, right? So we know 2.303. So we know this value is given 0 0.03. We can pop that right in there. We can calculate this value. And we know that this value now equals SR over R. So we can solve for SR by putting in our value for R, multiply it by this one. So multiply both sides by that value. And that's going to give us our value for SR or the absolute uncertainty. And so that's gonna be 1.3 times 10 to the minus five uh, molar concentration or moles per liter. And we can then put that in a parentheses next to the main number when we actually report this, right? So this is to the minus four, this is to the minus five, so we can walk this back one and then it will be to the minus four as well. So we can say 1.9 plus or minus 0.1 times 10 to the minus four. So kind of both of these times 10 to the minus four to give us our value. Um, so this is our R value, and then that is the uncertainty around that value. So hopefully this makes sense. Again, anytime you're calculating for R, you first have to rearrange your equation so that you're solving for R. In this case, that was the molar concentration of the protons. That gives you some equation that you can go back to your table and look for. Right? And then once you find that, that's going to give you your correct equation for calculating the uncertainty. So why do this? It's painful, right? The propagation of uncertainty is going to allow us to estimate an expected uncertainty for an analysis. So this is important to do because we're going to compare that expected with the actual. And so it can help us identify the presence of an error and help us correct it, right? So if we're not in that air range, right? If our value is outside of that air range, we're gonna be like, oh, that's not the expected air that I would expect just based on the determinant air from the measurement system that I'm using. It can help you identify the presence of that air. It can also aid in deciding how to improve an analytical procedure by helping to reduce the uncertainty. So maybe you're doing two steps or something like that and the uncertainty becomes really huge. So you're not gonna want to keep doing that technique on your experiment if it's driving up the uncertainty in that experiment. So you may say, okay, well, maybe instead of doing this step, I can analyze this in a different way that'll help reduce that uncertainty. It can also help determine which procedure to use. So if there's two, if there are many different procedures to try, you want to choose the one that has the lowest level of uncertainty. So calculating the propagation of uncertainty becomes an important mission.